Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. Today's show is going to feature Mandy Morris sharing powerful secrets of manifesting, plus some of the steps to manifest anything that you want. And she's here also to talk about her new book, The Eight Secrets to Powerful Manifesting. Great read. This podcast has been nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award. It's listed in Welt Magazine as one of the top best podcasts to listen to. And right now, Dare to Dream is in the running for a COVR Award, which stands for the Coalition of Visionary Resources. So send me good juju for that. That would be just awesome to place with all those profound people. And the show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness. They do energy work, healing work out into the world. You can become a facilitator or join one of their classes anywhere, anytime. Go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com and accessconsciousness.com. I am Debbie Dashinger. I am a media visibility coach, and I show people how to write a highly engaging book. I'm a book writing coach, both through my intimate classes and we meet on Zoom or from my private sessions. The second leg of visibility media that I teach is how to become an international best-selling author. And I do all the heavy lifting for the author, fully done for you and guaranteed. And the third piece of it is how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. If you like to start AAVs today, it would be my pleasure to show you how free my gift to you Go to debbiedashinger.com slash gift and get your information so you can start becoming visible in media right away. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash gift. And today's show features the secrets to change your life into easy, consistent manifesting. My guest is Mandy Morris, who's an entrepreneur, philanthropist, and manifestation expert. She's the creator of Authentic Living, an online company designed to help individuals reconnect with their authentic selves to find purpose, peace, and deep healing. Mandy and her brands have been featured in media outlets such as Shape, Mind Body Green, The Chalkboard, BuzzFeed, Well and Good, and Thrive Global, as well as on notable podcasts, including The Jenny McCarthy Show, Your Own Magic, and Hungry for Happiness. Her company, Authentic Living, is an educational organization with more than 800,000 students in over 60 countries, both online and in-person courses. Her science and love-based methods for creating lasting change have been taught and used by therapists and coaches globally. You can find out more about her at mandymorris.love. And with that, I welcome Mandy Morris to the Dare to Dream show. It's great to have you here today. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited for this conversation. Me too. I want to congratulate you on your new book. And also, because I'm a visibility coach, I really love when somebody's willing to be visible. And <laughs> when I was re researching you, there is no doubt you're going for it right now. So let's start by just saying, what is this journey like? Where, where did you get to open yourself in such a big way with the launch of this book? You know, I have to thank everyone in my team as well, but the whole book in and of itself was a manifestation. So when it first began and the years in writing it and the incredible growth that happened throughout it, I was like, this has to get into whoever I'm okay with surrendering to it, but it has to get into the hands of as many people as possible that it can touch. And so it's been a completely wild ride. We pulled out every stop we possibly could. We have the most amazing friends who supported us through the process, many New York times bestsellers and incredible authors. So we were like, what do we do? How do we make this happen? How do we make sure that it reaches everybody it's supposed to reach? So we started off in such like a, an incline, such an incredible space. And I'm like, oh, just wait, world, just wait. We're just getting started. Ooh, that's a good message to send out. I like that. Like you're basically saying, bring it. I'm ready. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and I, you know, and what's so beautiful about what you just said, Mandy, is the fact that this is what you teach. This is the energy of the book. So you're being that energy right now out into the world. It's a great example. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. That's been one of my highest compliments is that I, when someone really knows me, if they're one of my friends or a colleague, they're like, you actually truly, truly practice what you preach. And I'm like, doesn't everybody? What? Like that's, that's how it's supposed to be. Right. Uh, So it's such a, a high compliment. Thank you. Yeah. Because when you're talking about manifestation, everybody can see it's happening or it's not. So there's a lot <laughs> pretty of transparent. <laughs> pretty transparent. <laughs> so your book, Eight Secrets to Powerful Manifesting, you write in the book that manifestation is the process of creating your reality, be it conscious or unconscious. Let's unpack that a little bit. Mm-hmm. What is your take on what manifestation is? Well, I think manifestation's gotten a really bad rap. It's like this idea of it's miracles and magic and everything will fall in our laps. And that's totally true to a certain point. You'll get to that point. But a lot of us have a lot of unpacking to do in the sense of trauma and past programming and what the world has told us we can or can't be. And so I imagine it as manifestation is the unconscious as well as conscious creation. It's our energy that's being sent outwardly all the time. It's not like I manifested this morning for an hour. No, we're doing it all the time. And so I imagine, okay, we could do that for an hour. You can do your mantra. You can do your affirmation. You can hope for and pray for what you want. And that's beautiful and and wonderful in its own right. But 23 other hours of the day, you're sending out potentially an oppositional energy. And we have to deal with that because we're always manifesting. So what are we saying consciously? But more importantly, what are we saying subconsciously that's contradicting what we want? Okay. What is the biggest thing you've manifested? in regards to the journey you are on right now, using your own principles and your own tools? Such a good question, Debbie, because for me, this is something that I I really realized when I looked at manifestation was we're not after the 3D thing. Yes, I have the houses and it sounds so silly. It's like makes me feel icky talking about it, but the cars and the money and the things, but I have happiness and I have healing and I have peace and I have abundance of joy and fulfillment. I have incredible, healthy children and an amazing husband. I have what I never had before, which is mental peace. So if I had to just umbrella it, that's truly my biggest manifestation is my service to the world. Actually, I'm going to add that. Sorry. There's no way to do one, but my fulfillment as well. I I really like that you said that. I think that makes sense to anybody listening to have mental peace above all else. Health probably and mental peace is is pretty tremendous. So then hearkening on that, you survived your childhood. And with this book, you actually strike a balance to make manifestation easy. What was, Mandy, the life journey that brought you here? Because that's quite an arc and a hero or heroine's journey that you went through to knowing these powerful creation actions. Well, as I said, I didn't know I'd be teaching manifestation. So I was on a healing journey by all means. And my mom always said that I was this, this light in the world and I would help all these, you know, kids. And I was just like wise beyond my years, but over the years I shut that light off. And my biggest moment, which I write about in the book was when my father called me and I was 13 and he was committing suicide and he had called, he had taken the bottle of pills and he was saying, daddy's just tired and you know, it's time to go. And I realized that although there were a few moments in my life prior to that, where as any child man, some programming happened, that was such a defining moment because I realized that, or I felt what I internalized, I should say, and perceived to be a realization that I was disposable, that mm-hmm. life wasn't worth living, that The person that at the time, although I didn't know my father was struggling so much and had so many demons, you know, that he was trying to not even heal from, but run from, he was my idea of perfection. You know, he was my hero at that time. And when he wanted to take his life, I was like, well, if he doesn't want to be here, then why would anybody else? And so that led me down this journey of choosing really dysfunctional relationships and choosing my trauma, getting really used to dysfunction and being familiar with it. And so anytime that something really healthy would show up, I'd be like, run for the hills because I don't know what that's like. I don't know how to maintain that. I don't, that doesn't really make sense to me. And so uh, I chose, you know, this dysfunctional and abusive relationships and friendships and ultimately chose to shut off my light for years and years. Yeah, that is a very powerful word you used, feeling disposable. And I would imagine that a lot of people have been through trauma can relate to that. And I think that's a really difficult one when that's the groove in the record that you recreate over and over and over again. How do you get out of, because that's a nightmare. 
right? It's bad enough. It was perpetrated on you as a child, but to get oneself out. So I know you give, um, and I've been playing with all these tools in your book. I know you give a lot of tools. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the ones you used to heal that feeling of being disposable? And on the other side, what was the new word that defined you? I used literally every single tool in certain ways and shapes and forms. The whole book, The Eight Secrets, was created because of me healing myself. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, let me share it with the world. And then I saw that it was working. And then I just kind of, you know, kept making it work, if you will. But one of the biggest secrets, I would say, or one of the biggest tools that I utilized was what I call detangling dense energy. Yes. And it's like, how do I take all this heaviness that once maybe was, you know, given to me or that I picked up from my father or whatever it is in life? But then how do I like pull that apart now that I've chosen it and that I continue to choose it because it's my new sense of normalcy. And so as I started working that out, I was like, this isn't even who I am. How empowering is that? That that's not who I actually am. And so as I pulled apart those pieces and was like, that thought isn't really mine. That thought came from this trauma. This part of me is inauthentic. Then I stripped it down. It was kind of like an onion, really just peeling the layers over time. And I was like, oh my gosh, I actually like myself. And I think the new definition of me would just be authentic. I know that word gets thrown out a lot and I'm like, oh no, it means something to me though. But authenticity, like I am who I am. I'm totally cool with it. I'm ever expanding and, and I love myself. And that was not something that I had for most of my life. Yeah. And that's so, so important to be the position from where you, from whence we go out into the world makes yeah. a huge difference. Okay, so you use detangling energy, especially this heavy, dense energy that you're talking about to return to the person, to the soul, as you say, that you were created to be. Yeah. What is our mind's role in our future self? How does that play out? Well, at first, and it's specific to whom I'm blessed to work with, our minds really aren't our friends. I call it the monkey brain. So the mind in and of itself is beautiful and it can do incredible things. But the way that, you know, we're talking about it, it's the programming, it's the trauma, it's the things that aren't serving us, the counter manifestation, as I call it. And so I like to consider like, if I'm going to utilize this mind, it's not bad in of itself, but I've got to detangle it. I've got to work it out. I've got to heal some things. And then it can actually work in coincidence with what I used to manifest, which is, you know, the heart space. It's that intuitive piece. It's the connection to the divine. It's the knowingness. But over time, the mind kind of, it feels like the mind is over on the left side or the right side, but over time it realigns to the center so that everything is a straight shot and it actually increases and bends time on our manifestations. But the mind needs a little bit of love and a little bit of work. Oh gosh. Okay. Loving the monkey mind. Um, so let's go a little bit into pattern interrupts. Um, you say that we should manage our psychological triggers using pattern interrupts. I feel like right now on the planet in general, um, this is going on. You know, a friend, I, I have a book writing class. Uh, because of something somebody wrote, we had this amazing discussion about what people are going through and some of the just heartbreaking statistics. Um, an increase in 40% of people, especially young people, by the way, in eating disorders because of the pandemic, depression, anxiety, et cetera. And so I think a pattern interrupt for people who are listening right now, either that they have an issue going on or for us highly sensitive people, of which I am definitely one, who pick up like a satellite dish other people's stuff depression yeah. and anxiety and are a little confused. Ooh, is that mine? I don't think so, but I'm feeling this. How can we pattern interrupt anything that's going on right now so we can switch up the energy completely? Well, going backwards a little bit and speaking of eating disorders, I talk about it like lightly in the book, but um, unfortunately, I struggled with eating disorders and I noticed it was this deep need for control. So talk about when the pandemic hits, we feel completely out of control. And all we're trying to do is either feel completely out of control in a way that we can control through substances, the drinking, the things that, you know, we're kind of floating around the internet. And I saw a lot of people doing or the hyper control of, let me, you know, control what I put in my body or how it's utilized as in, you know, the form of an eating disorder. So the pattern interrupts. And this is something truly like, if I think about it from an energetic level, our energy, our, where our consciousness goes, where our thought energy goes, that creates everything, literally everything. And so something like where all of our consciousness is going towards the world is basically ending. 
or nobody knows what the heck is going on. What does this mean? What is this going to become? The greatest interrupts we can do, which is a little bit authentic to each person or a little bit different for each person is what can I do to ensure my consciousness does not continue to go into the reality in which is, I think, being fed to me? Because we can't always see, okay, oh my gosh, should I really create all of this? I'm really at the epicenter of this creation. That's a little hard sometimes for people. I get it. So at least we have to go, well, let me stop the flow of consciousness. And so interrupts could be anything from something simplistic. As soon as that thought comes up, I'm out of control. Is the pandemic ever going to end? What's going on in the Ukraine? Like, oh my gosh, it's like, boom, boom, boom. Clearly in some way, shape or form, I have goosebumps. So I hope that this is received. The universe is telling us something and we're not getting it. We're not hearing it, man. So that dominant frequency that planet earth is currently sitting on that we keep feeding into is primarily negative. That's not to be fearful of. It's okay. We're going to turn it around. I trust in that, but we have to interrupt the flow of that consciousness. And that could be something as simple as when those fears pop up, we go, what can I do to physically move this energy in my body? If I notice that energy gets stuck in my body, right? Talk about psychosomatic stuff. Or what can I do to mentally, um, I always used to do like Oprah in my face going, girl, like we, we don't have time for this. And she's snapping and I'm like, right, right, right. Oprah, sorry, serve the world. Or, uh, you know, something spiritual, like let me drop into meditation or let me talk to my higher power. But we have to do something in opposition to the energy in which we create that causes or further feeds whatever it is in life. And you could enter these huge things globally, as well as in our personal worlds. But how do I stop the flow of energy that I'm giving, that I'm accidentally breathing into this reality so that I can pull that energy back and then decide consciously where it goes. And that's the idea of a pattern interrupt is stopping the flow of energy and moving it towards a different direction. Yeah. Give us an example, if you don't mind, of something from your life or a client's life where this was going on and they or you successfully employed a pattern interrupt. So I'll tell you two, because these just immediately popped up as you were talking. One, this one's a little heavy, but uh, remember back in 2020 when uh, finally trafficking was getting a lot of publicity. We were finally talking about it. We were doing something about it. Well, that's one of my biggest triggers is child trafficking, um, sex trafficking, you know, that type of abuse. And so I was at first really debilitated, but over time I realized every time, once I got myself out of that, you know, deeper rut, I would do 10 jump squats. And I decided that I would actually film myself in my group because a lot of, um, the folks in some of my groups, they they, they're feeling it too. You know, they're, a lot of their triggers are similar. And so I was like, let's do this. Let's do this together. But I want you guys to feel the energetic shift. Cause for some reason, 10 jump squats just does it for me. Doesn't for everybody, but it does for me. And so I sat there and I, I had a couple of tears in my eyes. Cause I was really feeling the pain of the world. Talk about, you know, what you said too. Like you feel it all, you know, you're like the whole world. I don't even know who I'm crying for, but there's somewhere in a corner of the universe. And so I did 10 jump squats and you could just see this energy wave over me of okay, now I can do something about it. I'm not debilitated anymore. And then for my other clients, sometimes it's something simple or silly. We'll be at an event and I'm like, okay, get up and twerk. Oh, you're going down that thought again, get up and twerk. Or, you know, snap, 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 say the F word. Like it's just something crazy and outlandish, especially like when you've got someone who's really like buttoned up, they're like, twerk, no way. And then they just, they break character because that's all it is. When we're in those dips, it's just a character. But when we break character, we realize that there are other parts of us that we can lean into. Oh, so good. It reminds me of, this is many decades ago, I had a cat, the cat died. Of course, for those of us who love, love, love our animals, it was devastating to me. And I was really depressed for, I would say at least a month, I could not get out of the funk and the grieving. And then a friend was getting married in New York and I flew back and it was a party. I mean, it was so amazing, the dancing and the celebration and being with friends from high school. And, the, you know, it was a beautiful experience. And when I got on the plane to come back home, I realized like checking in, something is totally different. I am not the same girl who got on that plane coming here. I am going back different and forevermore going forward. That depression was broken. The grieving was complete. And I was in a joy spot. And that's like a reference point for me. Always, if I think, oh, should I go to that thing? You know, do I feel like getting, it happened last night. I have a client who was doing a book reading. Oh, should I go? And the, you know, it's far, the, all the stuff that comes up. And I went, it was an intuitive, go. 
And I came back so elated. It was a beautiful event. I was with human beings again uh, in a theater and I was so grateful that I did it. So yes, I, I intimately understand. I appreciate the way you explained it because I think now it can be used more, even yeah. more. Yeah, absolutely. Even like realizations, if I can share this story with you. Um, this was a couple months ago, so it's fresh. So I think it, hopefully it's helpful. Um, a few months back, I was pregnant and unfortunately we miscarried a little girl and it was the first miscarriage, you know, I've ever lost a child in that way before. And she was named and everything. And I sat there and I was like, wow, how am I going to move through this? We were about to launch the book, you know, the many things going on in my life. And I was like, how am I going to move through this authentically, fully feel, you know, the grief similar to when I've lost other people. And what is this going to look like for me? And my pattern interrupt to really condense that whole story, my pattern interrupt and up being me realizing that I wasn't seeing things clearly. I was seeing through the eyes of grief as a mother, but there was something so much more beautiful than that. And it was that my daughter had come with this incredible high vibration. And my friend actually had gifted me this pattern interrupt. And she said, Mandy, I know I can tell you this, but on a very, 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 very high vibration. This was the most incredible orchestration of love. And I just felt it. And I was like, I know, I know it's not loss. That's the lenses that I saw through, which is why it caused a trigger, which is what needed a pattern interrupt in the first place. But if I can see it through love's eyes, through source's eyes and see the beauty in all things, this was an incredible orchestration of existence and to me, unconditional love. So that was my pattern interrupt was the realization that I was not even seeing it correctly. So that's also a great pattern interrupt. That's a big story you just told. So <laughs> it's a big story. It's a big yeah. event for someone to go through when you say, cause that's a lovely thing for your friend to gift you with. Yeah. So when you say, ah, this was a gift of love actually that I received, you changed the lens. What do you mean by that? What was it about it that you saw when you looked through the eyes of source? So I think the first thing, if I comparatively speaking was, oh my gosh, I'm a manifester. Why would I create this? What happened here? Why would I ask to lose this daughter? It would be my first daughter. I have sons. I was so excited and the vibration was so high. The entire pregnancy was so beautiful. And then boom, it just kind of, you know, it happened so quick. And so I chose to lean in and say, there's got to be a lesson here. There's got to be something beautiful, but where the heck is it? And so once I got to that space, I saw, oh my gosh, this is how I interpreted it was that in this incredible space that my daughter lives, exists, whatever you want to call it, you know, this, this vibration is what I will, uh, it's what I say, at least she's in this incredibly high vibration. She came to me in, I would say I'm probably in a denser vibration than wherever she is, but she came in for a moment to either experience something from me and she got it so quickly. Maybe it was unconditional love. I have no idea. Or what I know for sure, she gifted me with a vibration, this exalted vibration that I've never had before and perfect timing right before my book comes out. I'm ready to serve the world in deeper levels. I'm ready to further expand in my purpose work. And she came in and just gave me this incredible gift of an energy of a perception of a shift change to understand and moving forward, help other parents who have gone through something similar, who have lost their children and been able to reshape that for someone where they can say, it's not all loss, like to give that to another parent. Oh my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. So that to me, that's God's eyes is all things are helping us evolve. Sometimes it's so freaking hard to see but that doesn't mean that it's not there. And I always believe that I can only teach from the embodiment. So I have to understand the frequency if I'm gonna teach it. Otherwise I'm like, sorry, I can't help you with this. I don't know. I don't know how to teach you how to do foosball or something. I'm, I'm not good at it, right? But if I can embody that energy, oh my gosh, then I can gift the frequency of healing, not just the words. So I feel like in the way that I saw it in Source's eyes, which is something that I gave myself over to in the sense of purpose work is, how do I further expand and serve the world in this pain because I'm capable of housing it and transmute it into something other than pain? Wow. <laughs> that was a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, just feeling all of that is, uh, that's exquisite, really. Thank and you, that's, yeah. you know, in the scheme of an earthly existence, that's a very fast transmutation for a big trauma. Yeah, it was. It was, a. I think, um, 
I found out that I'd lost her. I'd lost her prior, but I found out that I lost her. I believe it was January 28th. Mm. So, you know, now we said a couple months later, but um, I got the lesson within about a month. Wow. Amazing. And bully for that friend. Yeah, I know. She's pretty amazing too. I love her. <laughs> yeah. It's another piece of love in your life. Yeah. So I know you're really gifted and uh, you channel. I would love to know more about your channeling, who or what you channel. Just talk a little bit about what that is for you and what comes through. This is so fun. I don't normally get to talk about this on podcasts. So this is already getting so exciting. <laughs> um, so it was a gift I had as a child. I didn't know um, that it was a gift or anything like that. But my mom would say, I would say otherworldly things. Mm -hmm. Again, when my light shut off for that duration of time, well over a decade, not really any channeling happened. In my early 20s, um, I randomly dropped into a channel and I'm a lefty, I'm a southpaw. And I started writing with my right hand and my voice changed. And it was a very theatrical channel. I didn't know what channeling was and it scared me. It scared me terribly. I thought it, you know, even though what I was saying was so beautiful, my religious programming, all of my stuff, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm being possessed. This is not good. And so I tried to shut it off. And it worked for a very short while until I met a, a friend who, you know, her father was um, a NASA scientist and uh, an alien contactee for the government and all this stuff. And that particular race of aliens, Pleiadians, started, you know, love, love beans, of course, started talking to me. And I was like, well, I'm either completely losing my mind or I have gifts that I didn't know, you know, in fullness are being activated. So then fast forward when I met my husband, who he's known as the spiritual activator, he's unbelievable. Just, he is not of this world. He's so incredible. And as soon as I met him, he actually comes from a lineage, his family um, and beyond. He's from the Philippines. So they're very open to, you know, energy work in these ways. He's a healer, but he knows what channelers are. And I dropped into the most beautiful channel and I felt so enveloped in love when, uh, you know, maybe a couple of weeks or so after I met him and I was like, oh, this is what it is. I, I have this, you know, perceivably this gift so I can bring in this otherworldly knowledge or tap into the collective mind, which Einstein and Edison and all, you know, Tesla, all of them did this. Uh, and coming from my lineage, my father was hyper intelligent. My great grandfather, you know, they were all genius IQ, but super effed up as we know. Um, but I was sitting there going, oh my gosh, I'm channeling love. I'm channeling what I feel is godly information. And I set my parameters so I would never be afraid of the energy again. And it's actually how a lot of my, my programs are built. A lot of my content is written in this state. Um, and then every once in a while, when I feel called and I'm, I get, you know, the thumbs up from the you know, proverbial universe, then I'll channel for family and friends or clients. Do you remember, are you one of those channels who remembers your conscious-ish as you're channeling? Or do you completely vacate and come back and say, how was that? Such a good question. Both. So it's weird. So I'll have these now it's kind of like a vague, like I can still feel it. Or if someone like, I'm like, what did I say? Cause I'm still regrounding at the end and they're talking or they're crying or whatever, you know, was said. And then they're like, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh yes, I remember. Cause I remember the energy of it, but I really, I think this is so important for channels too, is don't bring the energy fully into you because then your body has to physically process it. So I try to just be like the fastest vessel possible, but that keeps my conscious mind kind of out of the way a little bit, but it tends to toggle for me. So it's only Pleiadians or a Pleiadian that you channel at? No, How no, many? not at all. Yeah, not at all anymore. It was Pleiadians in the beginning. For some reason, I think that's just what I could access. I don't know. And now um, it tends to be and I don't channel as much as I used to, but it tends to be higher selves. Um, I can't channel people who have passed. It, I don't know why it just can't happen. Um, and then I, I, I don't want to say God, but it is a godly energy. You know, it, it's just, it's like this love frequency that comes through whatever it is that someone's like highest version of them needs to hear. That tends to be what it is now. I don't really communicate with them um, with aliens or anything like that anymore. Very often, at least. Oh boy, because this is the show. So if, <laughs> if you ever want to go there and you do want to channel extraterrestrial beings, um, I'm always so cautious because I don't like to use the word alien and, you know, because it's not that. Yeah. Um, they're just as profound as we are. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I'm very much into it. I just had Dr. Stephen Greer on the show and yeah. Yes. Yes. I saw that. I was like, oh yes. So 
I think it just kind of comes in and out. Sometimes I'm like, okay, this is something that's supposed to come through. And then they just don't for a while. And it's something different. And I just kind of honor the process. Try not to get in my head about it. Okay. Yeah. That's, I'm very, very happy to know that. Really, I am. A little jealous, but happy. <laughs> so something I was playing with last night uh, as I was going to sleep from the book was about rewriting rules. And that is so fun. Like there were a lot of moments in the book where I went, oh, I never thought of it like that. There were like these little nuggets that were a good reframe for me and definitely rewriting the rules is a reframe. So I just want to read a quote from your book for folks who are watching and listening, which is rewriting the rules is one of the final finishing touches on your ability to easily manifest. Decidedly naming and adjusting your rules is crucial because your mind needs mental constructs to work with a map of parameters that guides you through your time on earth. When you change beliefs, your energy and brain reflect that. Talk about the rules. You even go, you even say, um, you can picture it, well, the beautiful gift box or a recipe box, right? And the index cards, that was kind of cool. Like, thing, thing, thing. <laughs> oh, boy, I was having a field day. So talk about what are the rules we have and how do we rewrite these rules? Well, first of all, thank you for reading the book and taking all of this, this knowledge. It means so much to me. And so rules, I realized, because I lived by the worst rules and most of my rules would contradict one another. So way, way back in the day, I had this rule and this was when I was completely miserable. Mind you, I had all these rules around what a perfect day would look like. And it was pretty simple, but it was, I'd wake up when I want to wake up, drink my coffee slowly. I could exercise, which I barely ever do now. Um, and then I could, you know, own a company that helped people and I could work when I want to work, come home, make dinner for my family, the family I never had. And, you know, my kids and my husband would be so happy with me. And I realized though, that in order for me to get where I thought I had to go, my rules were in order for, you to, for me to make, you know, decent money and help people, I probably need to be working 16 to 20 hours a day. I was taught that I perceived that I had jobs where I had to do that. And so I was like, well, okay. But then if I'm gone 16, 20 hours a day, then there goes my mornings. There's no slow drinking coffee. There's no exercise. And then probably I won't be home to cook any dinner for my kids. My kids are going to grow up hating me. And then my husband is going to cheat on me because I'm never around. So I had all these rules that ensured that I ran in circles and never got where I was trying to go. So when I started breaking those down, like bringing in, what are my rules around love? What are my rules around purpose work? What are my rules around self-care? Like whatever it is, whatever I was struggling with, whatever didn't look the way I wanted it to look, I'd be like, what does my environment really look like? And what rules would be there? And I would imagine it like a box because as, I, as you read, like we need constructs. It's not like everything is perfect. Every moment I'm just floating. Like that happens after we die probably, but that's not here in this human plane. So I have to be able to say, okay, this construct no longer works or it never did, but what is the new one? And so I started placing myself into new spaces of, okay, instead of my rule, and it's the hidden rule sometimes, it's not the pretend, you know, fairy tale rule for love. Love is, you know, unsafe. Love doesn't last. Does that have to be true all the time? Is there a new truth that I could choose that my brain will get on board with that feels accurate? But I don't have to go all the way to like, love is abundant and kind in every moment and everything's magical. That my brain would be like, hell no, that's a lie. That doesn't feel true to me. And so instead I would say, okay, what is two steps outside of that box? Where if I take a knife and I cut open that box, what pours out, what needs to go and what can stay? And so it helped me. And I do this every 90 days, still almost like clockwork, not quite, but pretty much where I'll go, okay, recheck the rule boxes. What are my current rules around love? What are my current rules around finances? What are my current rules around who I am for the world or what I need to do or who I have to be or whatever it is. And anything that no longer works, we just get to shift it a little bit and then build a couple new, you know, action steps and behaviors around it. And man, it makes things so simple. And it's like laid out on paper where you're like, I can just suck myself right into it, but I've got a full framework, you know? And once you write out the new rule, you throw out the old rule, you create a new rule. And I understand you're going by degrees too. You can get to the optimal rule in that regard. What allows you to make the shift and fully believe the new rule? Because that's sort of a pattern interrupt too. 
Yeah. So I call it the basement or the ceiling. That's kind of where the rules live in. So we live between how good will things get before we think it's too good or we'll sabotage it and how bad do things get before we will make a change. So I always use relationship as an example because my relationships in the past were just so terrible. And so if it was too good, if a guy will just use intimate relationships, if a guy was so sweet, wanted to talk about feelings, wanted to open up, I'd be like, head for the hills, Mandy. No, thank you. I didn't even find it attractive because I was just so lost in the, you know, the dysfunctional attraction. But my basement, which was terrible, was it had to be physically abusive before I would leave. Mm. So I was living in between this reality, this rule box, this ceiling, this basement that were ensuring that I would never find fulfillment. And so I noticed though, I can't completely change the whole rule box at once sometimes. Like the mind is just not gonna be on board with that. So I would imagine, okay, now I know when I will sabotage. So let me take it two steps up. Not so that I blast through the ceiling, that'd be super cool, sometimes that happens, but sometimes I'm gonna have to just like chisel at it and get through. So instead I'd be like, okay, is it so bad to have a healthy, functional relationship? Let me sit with it for a moment. Let me not run away so fast. Let me lean in a little bit longer than I normally would. We just do something a little bit different than we normally would. And also on the other end, on the basement, when you would normally do something about how terrible it is, do the same action that you would do at that rock bottom a few steps before you get there. So for me, it would be as soon as he cheated. Not when he becomes abusive, but when he cheats, that's a great time to probably consider heading out the door. And so the cool thing that happens is that as we raise this basement or this ceiling, everything goes with it and new rules tend to evolve from it, but they feel genuine and true because you're living it, the gift of embodiment. You're actually feeling what it feels like to lean into it instead of just saying, well, this is what I say my new rule is and somehow I will adapt my entire personality around it probably not going to happen. But if we lean into it and we understand the pattern in which we live in, as we vibrate in between our ceiling and our basement, we go, oh, that's why it didn't work. Oh, this doesn't serve me. And when the brain knows, or we'll call it the mind to be more, more specific, when the mind knows that it's not actually accomplishing what it thought it was accomplishing, it will not do it anymore. We always run towards pleasure away from pain. But when you realize that the rewards you have were perceived. So my reward for being in dysfunctional relationships was emotionally unavailable people. I mean, I can be emotionally unavailable too, which means I meet my sense of certainty because of my father and so forth. So I had a reward. But when I realized that what I consciously wanted, which was a healthy relationship, you know, someone who was faithful, I wanted to feel good about my relationship. And I realized that what I was choosing, the rules I had were ensuring that I never got there, man, they almost like just start disintegrating on their own because they hold no weight. Wow. I wonder, do you even recognize yourself sometimes? Like does the child Mandy or the teenage Mandy look at you and go, damn, <laughs> this was worth sticking around for. She's so fucking proud. If I had to go back, she's probably like, what? Like beyond beyond anything I thought that was wildly possible. I mean, I was very much um, external. So I was like, oh, well, if you have a good job, if you got, if you look good and blah, 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 you know, that was as far as I could go in those lost moments. But I think that I would, the old version of me would be so intimidated, but so proud and felt so loved by who I am today. But I am vastly, vastly different. Yeah, totally. Based on your story. That <laughs> really obvious. So kudos. Thank you. Um, it's possible. It's possible. hundred percent. hundred percent. So how do people work with you? I'm curious about that. What, if somebody's listening and going, wow, this sounds really cool. What are the things you offer for people to connect with you and learn from you? So right now it's primarily digital programs. One of the biggest things like our bread and butter and authentic living, which is the company I have is our practitioner programs. So I know that there's only one of me. I can't do one-on-one -on -one work very much. I'll do one-on-one -on -one work for family and friends, like here and there, if they're totally willing to grow, or if it's like an emergency call from, you know, like world leader type thing. Uh, and otherwise I'm like, if they, if they implement the lessons and the information, even just the book that I've laid out, life gets drastically different. And my rule is let me work myself out of a job. So I always teach my practitioners that because there's only one of me. I want 
not tons of me, because that's not the point, but I do want tons of people who are serving the world and care and love for the world the way that I do. So I've kind of shifted focus to focusing on my practitioners and my healers and so forth. But other than that, it's all just the digital products or the physical products. And every once in a while, we'll throw an event and they're, they're freaking amazing. They're so much fun. But uh, other than that, it's just let me build all the framework so it can outlive me. Ah, yeah, got it. That's great. Um, legacy there. So other than what we've already talked about, Mandy, are there any other specific steps you want to mention that you feel called to talk about in regards to manifesting, shifting and healing one's life? Oh, that's such a good question. The first one that popped up for me would be one of the secrets that I talk about, and it's embodying your future self. And as I burp, sorry, I remember, <laughs> I remember doing this. That's when truth comes out. Here comes the conscious channel, I guess. I remember sitting there um, thinking about all of these intelligent people, because I used to think that intelligence was most important. And so I really looked up to Einstein and Tesla and different inventors. And I didn't remember that I had a lot of that intelligence as a child. I still, I don't know if it's ever going to fully come back to me, but it works in a different way now. And it was perfectly so, but I looked up to that so much, but I noticed in what I said earlier, that they would tap into this incredible space, seemingly outside of them, but really deeply to me, what I would call it deeply inside of them. And so that's where that lesson came from. I remember sitting there one day, I was looking at these trees, I was living in Dallas and boom, it just hit me. And I was like, there's a version of me that already did it. Multidimensional self, right? There's a version of me that already did it. There is a collective mind I can immediately tap into it. It will always provide me the guidance, always. And boom, I dropped into, you know, a channel and pulled out the understanding of the future self and ended up calling my future self. This is how this happened. It's a little silly sounding, but it's just what it is. It's just how it happened. I was calling, I called her billionaire Mandy. It had nothing to do with the money, but it's just like that full abundant version. And I called her and there was a pay phone on the beach. She was on a beach, but there was a pay phone. She runs over to it, you know, and she's, she hops on there and she is blunt as all get out. And she's very, you know, forward, but she's just filled with love. Like you can just feel like she just knows who the heck she is. And it was really, really cool to witness that. And I was asking her different questions about some trials and tribulations I was dealing with where I was like, I just can't get the intuitive answer right now. I want to do the right thing, or I want to know the next step, hmm. but I think my mind is trying to provide a step and it's not the right one. And boom, all this incredible information came through. And I was like, everybody can do this. And it's so simplistic. And the biggest thing is just getting your mind out of the way. And so if I could invite everyone, um, you just get yourself into, I walk it, you know, through it in the book, but get yourself into a meditative state as deep as you can go. And that could be, you could be sitting there kayaking. Like I don't meditate like sitting in Ohm very often. Cause I just can't, like, as you can tell, I'm kind of like, I'm all over the place sometimes. So find your perfect practice of meditation. And then once you get there, feel free to create a visual. I do. I go to a white room and then I go to this sacred place that I've built in my mind, but then I meet whatever version of me. And there's, again, there's an infinite number of versions of us. We just direct our consciousness towards one in one moment, which means that we can do it at any moment as well outside of our physical human body. Right. And then I would ask a question, just ask something, be okay with whatever comes out. It could be a word, an energy, a color, a tool. It could be all the answers just bright as day, but lean into it and know that it's the next either breadcrumb or the whole kit and caboodle and lean into it, do it, trust it because it is intuitive, incredible, truly divine knowledge. I've never seen it happen any differently as long as someone leans in. And when you do this, Mandy, is there a way that you do get your mind out of the way? Because I imagine it'd be so hard to go, ah, oh, I'm creating this, I'm imagining this. I'm, you know, you really do want your future self to be speaking to you because there is, that's priceless. Yeah. To to that kind of information. So there's this saying, and this is what I would, I always attest to this because I feel like I'm totally the type to get, let my mind get in the way because my mind was built for survival and, you know, protection and all that stuff. So this saying, and I'm always going to butcher it, but it's not from me. I don't know who said it, but I say it all the time. So I should probably figure out who I need to give credit to, but it is 99% of people will make a decision and spend all of their energy freaking out and wondering if it was in fact the right decision. But 1% of people will make a decision and spend all of their energy afterwards proving mm -hmm. that it was in fact the right decision. 
So I'm like, if you can create, if you are literally going to go and ask your future self, then you're already living on a different consciousness. So if we can create everything in every moment, if you so choose to believe that for a moment here, free, free will universe, then it doesn't matter what the answer even was in the first freaking place. It's that you're going to fully lean into it and create from it. You're going to pour your consciousness into it and it's going to be fantastic. You know what I mean? So I, I've always kind of leaned on that when someone's like, but what is, is it? My mind is it my blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you're not even focusing on the right thing. Just follow the damn thing. It said, take like lead and lean in and, and see what beautiful things come through with it because you'll be fully in on the process and you'll be leaning into it and you'll be learning about yourself. It, of course it's the right thing. Yeah. That is so worth repeating. Will you repeat that bastardized quote once again. <laughs> yes. good just the way it was. Yes. Uh, 99% of people will make a decision and spend all of their energy freaking out and wondering and panicking if it was the right decision. But 1% of people will make a decision and spend all of their energy afterwards proving that it was in fact the right decision. Oof, I know. I love it. It feels so I got goosebumps too. It feels so good. Yeah. And also truth, right? Yes. The truth of that. And for everybody, there's some pocket in your life where you've done that. I don't care if you're doing affirmations, you were doing deep energetic healing work, and you know, when you come back out of that, everything's going to be different because there's something huge. Maybe it's shamanic soul retrieval, et cetera. And you come back out and there is proof everywhere, how you feel internally, but also what's showing up and presenting. 100%. Yeah, to live from that place. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> it's so magical. That's where all the magic happens. Like that's what you know. What manifestation has been called for so long, or what it's felt. That's true, absolutely. But we just have to get there. There's little work to be done to kind of sort out the pieces that kept us from staying in that miraculous space. Mm-hmm. And what do you do, Mandy, on a daily basis that keeps you? It's not exercise, so. <laughs> but what do you do on a daily basis that keeps you focused, that keeps you centered, that keeps you in a state of flow, that all these beautiful things can happen? So I remember, um, this was a couple of years back, my husband and I were sitting in our house in Laguna, and this random question just kind of flooded in, and I asked him, I was like, how would you know that you lived a good life? Like, what would be your parameters? At the end, you know, we're, we're in the rocking chair on our, our porch someday, sitting in our underwear, yelling at everybody, like, how, how are you going to know? And he's like, he said all these different things. He's like, uh, you know, my, our children would be happy and, but we, and all this stuff. And he's like, what about you? And I was like, to feel God's presence in everything that I do. And that stuck with me. And it's just when I finally turned my life around, I realized that that was the missing piece was that I felt a divine presence with me and in me in all moments. And so most of my days now are, How do I make sure that I'm tapping into or trying to pull in or be with and become and experience and give out that frequency that to me is so divine? And it could be anything. It could be I sit and I drink wine one day. It could be the next day I am exercising. It could be that I'm going to, you know, lay in bed and giggle with my kids and my dogs. It could could be, you know, I'm going to go out and speak on a big old summit. It could be anything. But as long as I'm pulling that frequency with me, then it's the right thing. So it lets me live in a little bit better of a flow, I guess. What is your soul's lesson, do you think, to have started where you were and to put in the work to become who you are? And you know the saying, our our wound becomes our gift or our mess becomes our message. What was it that was needing to happen for you on a soul level, uh, growing up in the situation and the relationships you did that had to be there? that was a catalyst for you to become the Mandy today? Mm, That's such a good question because I've been so focused on my mission that to think about my lesson is, is a new thought. If I look back at like my life, I, I kind of separated myself, my human story. I can't say that it didn't define me. I know it did. I know that very much, but I feel like my human story, instead of me living it, breathing it, being in pain with it, you know, even healing through it was so that I could understand how humans feel. Because if I don't understand how humans feel in their darkest moments and the pain that they have, I can't help them through it. And I don't mean to sound otherworldly, but when I separate my human and my soul and, you know, in the different parts of me, my human story was most likely the lessons in which I could embody and understand how the human mind works 
so that I could shift it. Because I think a part of going into mission is that as we all are, we're here to raise our consciousness. And some of us are trying to raise each other's consciousness too. And maybe I'm one of those trying to, you know, ignite some folks that come on, let's go. And then someone can help me too. And we'll all do it together. But those lessons feel like they fed right into my mission of why I was here. And I don't know. It doesn't feel like a lesson anymore. It just feels like this is what we do until we're not here anymore. Mm. Highest version of yourself for sure. <sighs> trying, trying every day to, to, to stay there, be there and become more for everyone else. And you teach something very unique in your book about manifestation boards and yeah, I thought that was really sensitive, you know? It's like everybody needs an attaboy or an atta girl. Everybody needs to know, because um, we're so conscious in this culture of creating, creating. You're only as good as your next, you know, best thing and success and achievement and all that. But your manifestation board is actually centered around, look at all I've done already. Like, let's just stop a moment and celebrate. Yeah. Can you talk about that? I think that would also be a really nice tool for people right now to just chill and appreciate. So what yeah. is that all about? So I remember making vision boards and every time I made a vision board, I didn't have any of the things on the damn vision board. So I was like, why isn't this working? So part of that, of course, is doing the work. But vision boards are beautiful in their own right. It's incredible once you're in that space. Yes, you are in pure potential, you know, create as you may want. But I noticed for myself in the beginning, it felt like such a distance to get towards where I am now and then what's on the vision board. They're two different vibrations, which is why it's not in my 3D right now. So then I have to bridge that whole gap, which is awesome. That's a part of doing the work. But one way to like shortcut or even get fully to the vision board creation is what I called manifested boards. And so I would have these boards all over. I remember when this first started in our little apartment in Dallas, I had all these manifested boards of clients and um, some of my philanthropic work in the Philippines. Now I've got, you know, my kids, places that we've moved, like all this beautiful stuff. And it would get me, I would sit in front of it and I would look at and feel, for me, it's just, I'm a total helper. Like I just can't help it. I'm, I'm put on the planet to serve in some ways. I totally get served as well, but I would sit there and I'd look at all the souls that I served and I would be so filled up with creation energy. And I'd look around at my life and be like, I already did it. I already created so many amazing things. I'm already an incredible manifester. So the next thing, awesome. It's already in the bag if it's in the highest good of all, but look what I already did. So I love encouraging people you have created something beautiful in your life already. Even if your life feels funky right now, you have created a cool job, a beautiful child, an incredible experience, maybe a good relationship, whatever it is, there's something wonderful. And that should be reminded of every single day so you can fill your cup up and remember that you're already an incredible creator. How often do you do your manifested boards? I'm terrible about it right now. I think the last time I did one was, let's Wait, say that honey, you been... get, I just want to say you get to be, you're in the middle of a book launch and you're doing this huge <laughs> media jaunt, like, hello. So right. yeah, respect. It's okay. Oh, actually, you just pinged me. So this is perfect. So thank you for saying that because my manifested boards now are usually just my journal, which I do every single day. So I do this thing called set it and forget it manifestation. So even my, literally my book deal with Hay House, I had written about back in 2016, completely forgot about it. So a lot of my manifested boards are actually in my journal because I'll do little drawings and my journals are crazy. I swear I need to write a journal, but they're just little you know, nutty things. But as far as my actual boards, the last time I did one, we were, this must have been in 2020, but my journals have kind of replaced that because I'm sitting there drawing everything out instead of, you know, cutting it out of magazines and all that jazz. But um, I really, I'm creating manifested boards every day. I guess if I look at it like that. Yeah, definitely. So this is Dare to Dream, Mandy. What are you next, Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams, goals, and secrets, secret desires to manifest that you can mm -hmm. share with us? 
the one thing that we're still very much in the energy of, and I say we, because I pull my team into it and I, I would, you know, not be able to be as incredible as I, I feel like I'm able to be for the world without them. And so one of our focuses is continuing to move the eight secrets um, out into the world, this, this book, this labor of love and letting it reach more and more people. And so that's been a huge focus. And then through that process, like that's kind of at the epicenter through that process, all of these incredible people, which was like a side piece of everything I wanted all these amazing people that want to work with us um, and incredible um, communities and ventures and experiences that are all coming into fruition so quickly just kind of trickled underneath it. But I'm not saying this is always the best thing for everyone, but I'm at this point in my life where I might absolutely, I'll set it, you know, I might set, set a couple goals, but I just focus on getting into this really high vibration. And then I just look around and I'm like, okay, what's available here? What's waiting for me here? And then I'll kind of snatch it off the shelf, if you will, and then experience it and then continue the growth. But that's really, it is just getting the book out there right now and making magic happen. Is there anything you want to tell the listeners here at the end? Mm -hmm. That there, whether you believe it or not, that there is someone somewhere, me and many other people, that genuinely and deeply believe in you and love you beyond belief. I'll just let that sit for a minute because that is really nice. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show today. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. This was so much fun and so beautiful. Yeah, for me as well. And folks, if you'd like to learn more about her, please do. Mandy Love. This is her new book, beautiful book. And really worth it because it, for those of you who love manifesting, love attraction, metaphysics and all that, and are really looking to change things up right now, there is information in here you won't get anywhere else. And I'm, I'm still playing with it and allowing these new pieces to get. I even have things do do dog ears like, you gotta <laughs> go back and do that one again. I love it. <laughs> yeah, so and this is, and it's a perfect book for a perfect time. And we really need this kind of, up leveling on the planet and with humanity, we can manifest for ourselves and also for the planet at large. It really needs us. We came here to be the light workers. And so, yeah, go forth and use these tools. Very powerful stuff. I end today's show with this quote from Abraham Hicks. The main event has never been the manifestation. The main event has always been the way you feel moment by moment, because that's what life is. Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Please like, subscribe. I read all your wonderful comments. If you're listening to us on podcasts, be sure to go to YouTube so you can see us. It's worth it. YouTube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Next week on the show, I am featuring Walter Zajac. He is a respected and popular psychic medium an NLP practitioner, and he's given powerful insights and helped to thousands of people in over 40 countries worldwide. He's quite a personality. Thanks so much for tuning in with us. And really, I think my message is the most important. Don't just dare to dream, dare to manifest and make all your dreams your reality because as you change, so you change the entire world. And we all need you right now. You're a piece of the puzzle of heaven on earth. Thanks for joining us.